Uh, Jeffrey Trezak, uh, director of the library, unfortunately is unable to be with us this evening. He went home early today because he wasn't feeling well. But he sends his greetings and appreciation to all of you for supporting the New Public Library through your attendance this evening. As Dale mentioned, my name is Spencer Scott. I'm the Chief Development Officer here at the library. I joined the staff here in August, so I'm still considered a newbie compared to all the staff who work here who've been here for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. I have a long way to go. I'd like to welcome you to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. commemorative lecture featuring Tim Wise. And you'll hear more about Tim a little bit later. I'm extremely pleased to introduce Ryan Haygood, President and CEO of the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, who will be serving as our moderator for this evening. For those of you who may not know, the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice seeks to ensure that urban residents live in a society that respects their humanity, provides equality for economic opportunity, empowers them to use their voice in the political process, and protects equal justice. The Institute employs a broad range of advocacy tools to advance its ambitious urban agenda, including research, analysis and writing, public education, grassroots organizing, communications, the development of pilot programs, legislative strategies, and litigation. Using a holistic approach to address the unique and critical issues facing New Jersey's urban communities, the Institute advocates for a systematic reform that is at once transformative, achievable in the state, and replicable in communities across the nation. And now, please welcome to the stage our moderator for this evening, Ryan Haygood, President and CEO of the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. Good evening. Let's give it up for the Newark Public Library for hosting tonight's event. I really want to thank Celeste Bateman, who's producing this event. If you, if you want someone to host a timely topic, and you want to ensure a successful event, Celeste Bateman is the person for the job. And I thank you, Spencer, for the introduction. I just want to share a few things before I get out of the way and bring our speaker to you this evening. I'm so excited to be here. I think this is such a critical moment in the life of this country, and in particular, the life of our state. So before bringing Tim to the stage, I want to say a few words that situate where we are in this important historical moment. But I want to first pause to thank my team at the Institute for Social Justice. We are as Spencer mentioned, a legal advocacy organization. And our mission really is to identify structural racial walls of inequality. That if we topple them, open up opportunities for people of color in our urban centers around economic justice, criminal justice reform, and civic engagement. So I want to talk a bit about where we are in New Jersey and situate that in a historical context, recognizing that this is about Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr who, as you all know, came to this mighty city 50 years ago last year. And so we have a table with information on it. One thing you'll find there is a commemorative poster that commemorates his visit to the city of Newark. And you all know that he came here 50 years ago last year because he wanted to build grassroots support for his National Poor People's Campaign. He left Newark, New Jersey, went to some other cities in New Jersey, and then he found his way eight days later to Memphis, Tennessee. And you all know that he traveled there to give what would be his last and perhaps most iconic speech, the I have been to the mountaintop speech. And it's interesting, we just celebrated his birthday. I was doing some reading about that, what that would mean for him at this moment, how there are many who are celebrating him. And I found a tweet from his daughter which talked about the period right after he was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. She said this, someone tweeted to me that my father, quote, didn't offend people. At the time my daddy was killed, a poll reflected that my father was the most hated man in America. The most hated. Many who quote him and who now use him to deter justice would likely have hated him too 
if they really knew my father. And I think about that. What does it mean to die the most hated man in America? And why was he the most hated man in America? Fifty years after his visit to this mighty city, we gather here tonight inspired by the unfinished work that Dr. King set out to do when his life was cut short. And this is a significant time to do it, to be sure, because we're in a time that's marked by incredible challenges alongside enormous opportunities. Fifty years after his visit to the Garden State, New Jersey, as my colleague Demelza Bear will tell you, is one of the wealthiest states in America. The median net worth of New Jersey's white families is greater than $271,000 a year, the highest in America. But the median net worth of New Jersey's Latino and black families is just $7,020 and $5,900, respectively. Did you catch that? The median net worth of New Jersey's white families is $271,000 a year, the highest in America. But by stark and staggering, really shameful contrast, the median net worth of New Jersey's Latino and black families is $7,020 and $5,900, respectively. And you don't have to go to the southern border of this country to see children of color torn from their families and caged. You see, that happens to black and brown kids at mind-blowing rates right here in New Jersey. In fact, as my colleague Andrea McChristian will tell you, a black child in New Jersey is 30 times more likely to be in prison than a white kid even though black and white kids commit most offenses at about the same rate. Of the more than 9 million people in the state of New Jersey, there are just 22 white kids who are in prison. Now, this is not a push to incarcerate more white kids, but it is a recognition that when we set out to do incarcerating, we incarcerate white kids as a very last, last, last resort for a comparison, think about our response to the opioid crisis versus our response to the crack cocaine epidemic that ravaged our cities 20, 30 years ago. It was for this reason that we stood with many of you, more than 500 people, a multicultural coalition of folks stood outside of Jamesburg, New Jersey's oldest and largest youth prison, on its 150th anniversary year to launch a campaign called 150 Years is Enough. And the aim of the campaign was to focus on transforming this entirely broken system, including closing New Jersey's failed youth prisons. And six months after we launched the campaign, then Governor Chris Christie, then Governor Chris Christie announced the closure of two of three youth prisons in New Jersey. This was really one of the more historical youth justice announcements in a generation, if not the last 150 years. And following this historical announcement that was occasioned by many folks in the room and outside the room, we began a campaign, 150 Years is Enough, a campaign focused on transforming the entire system, seeking to make investments in our kids, not in incarcerating our kids. But something happened in the last year. And instead of realizing this transformation, New Jersey actually deepened its investment in incarcerating kids. So that this year, in this year's fiscal budget, 2019, New Jersey will spend $281,000 to incarcerate each kid in its youth prisons. This is a nearly $30,000 increase from the previous year. And I ask you all, as I look at my wife and educator, imagine my daughter and educator, imagine what you could do in the life of a kid were you to invest $281,000 a year. And because New Jersey connects voting to this broken criminal justice system, you literally see racial discrimination shifted from the criminal justice system into the political process. So that today, 100,000 people who are in prison, on parole, and probation cannot vote because they have criminal convictions. 50% of them are black the black folks make up just 15% of the overall population in New Jersey. New Jersey first denied the right to vote to people with criminal convictions in 1844. 
1844 was a year that New Jersey restricted voting to white men only. And so these numbers are difficult to grapple with, and they paint a picture of incredibly difficult challenges we face. But I mentioned at the top that these challenges exist alongside incredible opportunities. And this difficult reality, I think, underscores the urgent need for fierce advocacy that emanates from the ground up in our communities, that begins to build systems that create black wealth and wealth in communities of color more broadly, that begins to transform New Jersey's shameful youth justice system, and that restores the right to vote to people with criminal convictions. Indeed, because of the advocacy of so many of us in the room and outside the room, this Thursday, in two days, a Senate subcommittee will hold a hearing on S. 2100. This is a historic bill that will restore the right to vote to nearly 100,000 people in prison, on parole, or on probation, and make New Jersey like Maine and Vermont, which don't withhold the right to vote for people with criminal convictions at all. In his last speech, the mountaintop speech, Dr. King knowing that death was near for him, talked about how he began a conversation with God where he longed for more time on the earth than he, know he, than he knew he had. And he said to God, you know, if I could ask you for a thing, I would ask you if I could just live a few more years into the second half of the 20th century, then I would be happy, he said. And I was thinking about that. What if Dr. King made his way into the 21st century? he would have seen the fruit of his march with many others over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Folks know the Edmund Pettus Bridge connects Selma to Montgomery. Folks know that that march over the bridge led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Folks also know that the march over that bridge in 1965, which led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act, within one generation led to the first black president of this country. If he had lived a little bit into the 21st century, he would have seen President Barack Obama. At that time, he would have been 79 years old. He then would have seen the first black attorney general of the United States of America, followed then by the first black woman to serve as the attorney general of this country. But if Dr. King had lived eight more years to 2016, he would have seen <laughs> white supremacy restored to the White House. He would have been 87 at that time. And I think he would have reminded us, had he lived to see that, Barack Obama and this president, had he seen that, he would have reminded us, as the American story goes, that you can't have one without the other. You can't have President Barack Obama without this president. You cannot have progress without attempts, sometimes successful attempts, to roll back progress, because that has always been our experience with this experiment called democracy. It has always been contested, particularly for black people, which is why Dr. King continued in that last speech, saying, the world is all messed up. The nation is sick. Trouble is in the land. Confusion is all around, he said. But I know, somehow, that only when it's dark enough can you see the stars. And I see God working in this period of the 20th century in a way that women, I incorporate that, and men, in some strange way are responding. Something is happening in our world. The masses of people are rising up, and wherever they are assembled today, whether they're in Johannesburg, South Africa, Nairobi, Kenya, Accra, Ghana, New York City, New York, Atlanta, Georgia, Jackson, Mississippi, Memphis, Tennessee, or Newark, New Jersey, the cry is always the same, that we want to be free. And so it is with us. This fight for freedom continues, inspired by Dr. King's fight for it and the fight waged by our ancestors who came to Jamestown, Virginia 400 years ago this year. Read Genesis 15, 13. And that fight for freedom, as it always has been, is fought alongside allies of every race, every color and creed. 
as I close, like so many of us, 2016 was a particularly devastating election. I had a conversation with my mother on that evening. My mother is white, my father is black, and my mother, like so many of us, was devastated. We began having a conversation about how it could happen. How was it that people of color voted in a particular way to move the country in one way and other folks didn't join those votes? My mom, for a moment, said, well, you know, I think we just needed more black people to vote. I said, Mommy, it may be the case that we needed more white women who shared the vision that black and brown people have for this country. Maybe we needed more white women. And my mom paused and said, you know what? I think you're right. I think what we needed were more white allies. And that's what Tim Wise is, an ally in the fight for racial justice, freedom, and liberation. He's recognized by scholar and philosopher Cornel West as, quote, a vanilla brother in the tradition of abolitionist John Brown. Right before we started, Justice Roundtree had a word with Tim, and Justice shared that while he was inside for a period, he was inspired by Tim's searing critique of race in America and how he, as a white man who didn't have to speak out on these issues, made it his life's purpose to challenge the status quo as a white man pushing against racial supremacy on the part of white folks, white allies. He spent the last 25 years speaking to audiences in all 50 states and internationally. This is about his fifth trip to Newark, New Jersey. He's been on more than 1,000 colleges and high school campuses at hundreds of professional and academic conferences and community groups across the land. And we're fortunate to have him join us again at the Newark Public Library in the mighty city of Newark, New Jersey. Please join me in welcoming Tim Wise. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much. A couple things. Uh, one is an apology. I want to apologize to everyone whose hand I have shaken since I got here. I think I'm getting a cold, so Ryan, you might wanna, you might wanna start by getting some sanitizer of some sort, passing that around, vitamin C, penicillin, whatever you got, you might wanna pass it around, I apologize. I was fine when I got here, but I've been here in the library in the back for like five hours, drinking tea, trying to you know, do what's right for my body, and I'm not altogether sure. But I'm gonna make it through this evening, and then I gotta take a train to Albany tomorrow theoretically, if they don't get three feet of snow, so we'll see how that goes. It is good to be back uh, in Newark to see some old friends, and I do not mean by that that you are necessarily aged. I just mean to say that I've known some of you uh, for quite a while, and in fact, there's someone in the room who I went to high school with who I have not seen in probably 33 years, which is really rather amazing. So uh, this is a nice little homecoming of sorts in that regard. Uh, I also want to thank Ryan for his comments regarding the way in which Dr. King was remembered at the time of his death because it leads into the comments that I wanted to make this evening. Um, you know, as I go around the country over the last 30 plus years speaking on MLK days in particular, it always strikes me that when I stand in front of a microphone to talk about this man's legacy and this movement of which he was a part, that often I'm not really sure which Dr. King people came to remember. Now, the good news is, I feel pretty confident I know which one y'all came to talk about. <laughs> so tonight, uh, I'm just going to relax and not really worry. See, a couple weeks ago, I was giving an MLK talk at a college. I will leave it unnamed. Nice folks, wonderful event. But we started off, we were sitting on stage. It was the president, or one of the board members of the college, and the president, and me. And we're on stage, and I'm looking at the program. And the program started off, they were doing the Pledge of Allegiance. And they were doing the Star Spangled Banner. I'm like, oh. And literally, and I had to see, I had to talk about it. See, I would have taken a knee. But, but a couple things. Number one, I didn't want to be a distraction in front of all this. Like the high school students, they'd have been like, what the hell is he doing? You know, and I got 50 year old knees from which I might not be able to stand up again. But, but see, then they had to give me the microphone for 35 minutes after doing all that nonsense at the outset. So I got to take a rhetorical knee, you know, in the middle of the speech. And, I, and at first I was nervous. I'm like, I don't know how these people are going to respond. I wasn't really nervous. I didn't care, you know. I mean, if you follow me, you know I'm not really worried that much about what people think. 
about what it is I say, but it was one of those moments where, again, I'm like, I don't know if y'all came to talk about this Dr. King, but I did, and it went fine. Uh, tonight, I don't even have to mess with that, because y'all came to talk about the real, the real deal, the real movement, and, and that's certainly what I came to talk about. And your comments, Ryan, reminded me of the profound lack of historical memory that shapes not only our commemorations of this man in the movement, but just life in general in America. And I fundamentally believe that if we had to pinpoint one thing, and I, I'm not saying there is one thing that explains the persistence of white supremacy in this culture, but if we had to pinpoint one thing, I think you could do worse than to claim a lack of historical memory as the thing. There may be other contenders, you know, but I think you could make a case that among the most profound contributors to the persistence and the ubiquity of white supremacy is not just a lack of historical memory, but a profoundly incorrect historical memory, which makes it incredibly difficult for us to see certain things in our history and be prepared for them. It also makes it very hard for us to understand how deeply ingrained white supremacy, how deeply ingrained anti-blackness in particular, how deeply ingrained all of the things that we see now have always been, because see, we have a lot of folks since 2016. And I'm not talking about people on the right now, I'm talking about nice white liberal people. God bless them. As we say in the South, you know, bless their heart. Nice white liberal people who say things like, this is unprecedented. This isn't normal. This is not the America that we know. Well, I, I think it is the America that man knew. Fairly confident it is the America most of y'all have known for all of your lives. It's certainly the one that I have come to recognize. And yet we have people who believe that this is some unprecedented moment. As if somehow a rich white man telling not rich white people that their enemies are black and brown was some new stuff. As if that was something Donald Trump thought up on his own. A rich white man telling not rich white people that their enemies are black and brown is literally the oldest play in the playbook of American politics. It is every bit of 400 years old. It's what we told working class, peasant class, European people who weren't even called white yet in the colonies because we didn't want them teaming up with black folk and jacking rich white people's stuff because at some point, they were all going to figure out the deal. You see, like at some point, they step on your neck long enough, you figure out who's wearing the boot. And the fear was that these poor peasant class Europeans, some of them indentured servants, would ultimately team up with enslaved African folk, as they sometimes did in places like Virginia during Bacon's Rebellion and other uprisings, and ultimately overthrow the aristocracy. So how do you stop that? You divide and conquer. Rich white people telling not rich white people their enemies are black and brown. Fast forward to the Civil War where my people in the southern sense of the word, clearly not in the ideological, but in the southern sense of the word, the rich, the elite, the white folks stood up and said, did they not, that the whole point of breaking away from the Union was to maintain enslavement and white supremacy. I know we lie about it now. And our flawed historical memory allows many to believe the lie, but now, at the time, they had no shame, so they just said it. See, that's the beauty of original documents, you know. Back in the day, they just, they didn't feel any need to pretend that that wasn't what it was. So the vice president of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens, said what? He said that the, the cornerstone of the new government was the great truth that the Negro was not the equal of the white man. So it wasn't about trade, and it wasn't about states' rights, and it wasn't about tariffs, and it wasn't about the proper recipe for a mint julep or how to smoke a pork butt. It was about holding other human beings in bondage whom you perceive to be inferior. But now the rich didn't want to fight the war because rich people, correct me if I'm wrong, don't go to war. Rich people get doctors to write phony notes saying they have heel spurs so they don't have to go to war. Rich people get poor people to do their fighting for them, but now if I'm rich and I own a whole bunch of human beings and a lot of land and you're poor and you don't own anything, why in the world would you go fight for me? Why would you do that? Like, why would you go fight so I can keep my stuff when you don't even own the shirt on your back? Only one reason, because rich white people told you, now listen, if they get free, they're going to take your job. No fool, they already have your job. That's the point, 
right? Because if I have to pay you a dollar a day to work on the farm and I can get the African enslaved person to do it for free because I own them, guess who got the job? Free got the job. And the one who had to charge got put out of work. So ironically, those poor white folks would have been better off joining up with black folks to overthrow the aristocracy. But rich white men said, your enemies are black and brown. Fight them, not me. And folks fell for it. And so the fact that this has been a constant theme, and now we're having the same situation with immigration, rich white man telling not rich white people their enemies are brown coming across that border. If we just build a wall, everything will be fine. Is that how capitalism works? You just build a wall and that's it? Like the owners of America are like, well, hell, you got me. Here's a raise. That's not how it works. Capital will always jump borders in search of the highest rate of return. Goods will always jump borders in search of the highest price. If you allow money to move and you allow stuff to move, but you don't allow people to move in search of the highest wage and the best conditions, you have permanently tilted the game in favor of owners and against working people, not just white working people, but black and brown working people, not just working people south of the border, but working people north of the border. That's how capitalism works. That's what Dr. King would say if he were here. And what we ignore, because again, our historical memory is entirely false. Right? So none of this is new. Right? Our lack of historical memory is what allows Mike Pence to say on national television that the President of the United States is doing, if not the Lord's work, at least Dr. King's, by building that wall. He literally said that right before he and Donald Trump went to the King Memorial for like two minutes, dropped off a wreath so the president could get back to the Oval Office and rage tweet some more. But our lack of historical memory allows that to happen and nobody thinks anything of it, see? And it just goes without comment, just like, and it's not just, and once again, it's not just Trump and it's not just Pence. This misuse of Dr. King's words and his memory Right? This is as ubiquitous as the celebrations of King themselves. And it's been permanent, and it's mostly been my folks, once again, in the corporate sense, not the ideological sense. White folks who think nothing of borrowing this man's words, the ones that suit them. Not the actual Dr. King. So they will quote forever and always one line out of one speech given on one day. Now, this man was a pastor. He spoke at least every Sunday. But they only like one line from one speech that they most certainly did not attend. They didn't even listen to the whole talk. They just like, you know the line, right? The, the, the one about judging people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin, because that's the one that goes down easy. Right? That's just like, and that's also the least important, least radical, least meaningful thing that this man ever said. It's like filler in that speech, literally. Listen to the full talk. Because these folks haven't. They didn't listen to the part where Dr. King said America had bounced a check to black people. They never talk about that. They don't even want you to know the name of the march. We just call it the March on Washington. That's not what it was called. It was called the March for Jobs and Freedom. And one of the platform planks of the organizers of the march was housing being seen as a human right, not as a commodity that one should have to pay for in a so-called free market. But now we don't talk about that. So which Dr. King do folks really want to recall? They definitely don't want to remember the one who one year to the day before he was taken from us at the Riverside Church in Manhattan said what? said that even though it pained him to admit it, he had to acknowledge that his country, your country, my country, our country, this country, had become the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. Now, you don't have to agree with his assessment, whether in 1967 at the height of the Vietnam War or today, you don't have to agree with it, but you are not free to pretend that he didn't say it. And that is what we as a nation do. It isn't just that we argue the point. Decent people can disagree. Dr. King is not a saint. Dr. King was not God. One can disagree with him about things. But one has to grapple with the actual man and the actual message, not this fabricated fictional one that we've sold the way that department stores sell products. Speaking of which, about 20 years ago, I was given a talk at an MLK Day in Seattle and literally opened the paper that morning, right before I was going out to give my talk. Right? And J.C. Penney, or one of them, Sears, when they were still a thing, one of them had a big front, not front page, but big, huge, like four-page spread in the paper. They were having a sale for MLK Day. 
because they've got to cash in on the holiday. Now, it was sort of funny because it was a white sale, so that's sort of funny. I mean, it's funny on two levels, right? Number one, selling white, but, but more importantly, you know, a white sale is sheet, so that's really ironic, right? It's a little weird. Right? I don't know if they were trying to be funny or they just were not paying any attention to what they were doing. Mean, it was weird. Right? But that just goes to show how quickly we'll marketize everything, commercialize everything, take all of the radical meaning, wring it out of the day so that we don't talk about these things and we don't think about the connection of those things to the present. And we tell little children these lies, these incomplete stories and half-truths about this movement so I can talk to young children and ask them, and I do this, I say, you know, what is... What is this day mean to you? What do you think Dr. King would say to you and say to us if he were still here? Now, I realize that I don't expect eight, nine, ten-year-old children to necessarily have a deep um, exegetical explanation of the history of white supremacy at eight, nine, or ten. I used to think that was possible. I expected it from my own children. I was sadly disappointed. But, but I learned to lower my expectations in the face of just child development milestones that clearly do not include that at 8, 9, or 10. So I learned to not blame children for not knowing all the stuff that people who were adults, well, are supposed to know. A lot of adults don't know it either. But I do expect that if I ask an 8, 9, or 10-year-old about what Dr. King would say, they'd give me more than this because this is what they give me because this is what they've been taught. It's not their fault. It's the fault of their teachers, the fault of their parents, the fault perhaps of the media and the way in which it represents the man's message. So they look back at me and they say, if Dr. King were here, you know what he would tell me? He'd say, don't join a gang. Don't pick up a gun. Don't fight. Don't hit people when they hit you. Yeah, I'm sure all of that is true. I'm fairly confident Dr. King would not want folks to join gangs, not pick up guns, and not fight physically violently. He was, after all, a deep believer in the philosophy of nonviolence. But now, if not joining a gang, not hitting people, and not picking up a gun were enough to get you a national holiday, my mother would have a national holiday, and y'all never heard of her. But she taught me the same stuff when I was five. So that clearly is not enough. That clearly is not the reason for which we remember this man. It's not nonviolence in the abstract. It was nonviolence in the service of a particular purpose, the purpose being the eradication of what Dr. King called the triple evils, none of which any politician in the modern era is willing to name. What were they? Poverty and materialism was one. Racism and white supremacy was two. And militarism was three. How many politicians in either party now are truly willing to stand up and name those things. We don't talk about poverty, we just talk about poor people. And when we talk about them, we don't talk about them the way that man talked about them. We talk about them as if they were lesser than other children of God. We don't talk about eradicating poverty, we talk about forcing poor people to be more responsible, ignoring the fact that poverty and being poor is very expensive and takes a lot of work to try to move beyond that. We don't talk about racism. We don't name that. Politicians don't name that. When Barack Obama even tried as president to name it, tried, and I think he could have done a lot more, but when he tried, right, just tried to make a simple point about the irrational arrest of Henry Louis Gates, a professor at Harvard, in his own home, for God's sake, and they came for him politically, said he was trying to destroy white police, said he was the most racist man in America when they passed a budget bill that included a very small tax, very small now, very tiny, like 10% surcharge on tanning booth visits. You know where this is going. 10% <laughs> surcharge on tanning booth. Now, why would you do that? You do that because that stuff is linked to cancer, right? You spend enough time in the tanning bed, it will kill you. But there were literally talk show hosts in this country prominent ones who said it was a racist tax because, you know, only white people go to the tanning booth. Number one, that's not true. Number two, you might as well thank Barack Obama for trying to save your white ass then because he was trying to make it more expensive so that you wouldn't go. Why is that not seen as a pro-white thing? That's a black guy trying to be like, just stop. Just stop. But even that, right, was seen as an attack because that's how we understand race, which is to say we don't. So our historical memory is what gets us in trouble. Only a lack of historical, a profound hate of historical memory would allow people with no sense of irony or misgiving 
to use as their slogan and put it on a hat and brand it. The slogan, Make America Great Again, because only a profound lack of historical memory could allow one to recognize for whom that slogan means, by definition, nothing. The fact that this country was never great for peoples of color, it was never great for LGBTQ folk, it was never great for most women as women. I beg to remind you that just women as women were, in most states, unable to get credit lines in their own name until 1971 when the Equal Credit Opportunity Act was passed. Prior to that, even white women now who have enjoyed certain perks and privileges of whiteness, but even white women couldn't get, they had to get their husband or their dad or some other man to vouch for them until the Equal Credit Opportunity Act was passed. So how great was America for them? How great was America for religious minorities? How great was America for anyone among the marginalized? And the answer is it wasn't. It was never great for poor people, no matter your race. It wasn't great for those children in Appalachia working in coal mines up until labor laws were passed and even afterward. Right? It was only great for a very narrow strata, but a lack of historical memory allows us to hear that slogan and believe that somehow it's not hearkening back to white supremacy. A lack of historical memory is what causes white folks to have such an entire systemic sort of existential come apart at the movement for black lives. And the mere slogan, Black Lives Matter, which sends us into fits of apoplexy, starts us itching and scratching, <laughs> gives us shingles, apparently. <laughs> my God, black lives matter. What about my life? <laughs> well, all lives matter. Don't they? Yes. Yes, precious. Yes. Yes, they do. I have two white daughters, very aware that their lives matter. The difference is, I'm not alone in this. Every police officer knows it. Every employer knows it. Every teacher knows it. Every loan officer at the bank knows it. Everybody at the mall when they go shopping knows it. Everybody knows it. They could walk anywhere in Staten Island and not get choked out like Eric Garner because everybody knows that their lives matter. See, that's the thing. You don't have to specify that which has always been taken for granted. You only have to specify that which has been left out, which is why we do not have White History Month, but we have Black History Month because we have several White History Months. They go by the tricky ass names that we gave them like May, June, July, August, <laughs> September, every other month that isn't specified for somebody else. You can bet that that's ours. You don't have to specify it. And you don't have to say all lives matter. You don't have to say white lives matter. We take that for granted. And as a country, we have a long history of saying all and not meaning it. Thomas Jefferson, who I'm told is one of white people's favorite white people, <laughs> once said, I think you know the words, all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among these, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But now when he wrote those pretty words, he owned over 230 people. So I am fairly confident he did not believe his own rhetoric. But it's very pretty rhetoric. The Pledge of Allegiance, the one that upset me so a couple of weeks ago at the college where I was speaking, ends with what words? As always, three different versions of it, 1880s, 1920s, and 1950s. The last words in the pledge are always with liberty and justice for all. But now, we all know that at every single iteration of the pledge, whether in the 1880s, the 1920s, or the 1950s, there wasn't such a thing in actual operation. So what does that mean? It means that when we say all, we don't mean it which is why white folks are just going to have to deal with saying black lives matter until black is part of all, every day in every way. See, but again, if you understood the history, that wouldn't even be controversial for me to say, right? It would be so obvious if we actually understood the history of law enforcement in black space, right? That law enforcement traces directly to slave patrols, the first iteration of such a thing, right? It was cops who enforced the laws. Like, I don't know why we act like it wasn't. Who do we think enforce the black codes? Law enforcement. Who do we think enforce segregation? Law enforcement. Who do we think delivered black bodies into the hands of the mob, opening up the jail cells and letting them out to be lynched, except law enforcement, people with badges and people with guns and people with the authority of the state? Who killed 27 members of the Black Panther Party in this country? Law enforcement. 
Who enforced the war on drugs, which I beg to remind you was not a war on drugs. Because we know that white folks use, possess, and deal drugs at exactly or precisely the very same rates as black and brown folks, and yet black and brown folks four times more likely to be arrested for weed and incarcerated. So it wasn't a war on drugs, but who enforced it? Law enforcement. And I didn't need the data to tell me that the war on drugs wasn't about drugs. I suspect you didn't either. We know it from personal experience, but let me share mine just so we're clear on it. And I can do this because the statute of limitations has expired and they cannot touch me now. 31 years ago this April, I was coming back from a debate tournament, college debate tournament. I was at Tulane. We were at a tournament in San Antonio, driving back in a rental car. Myself, my debate partner, another two-person team, and the coach. And as we got into this little place called Gonzales, Texas, we're actually going through this little place called Gonzales, Texas on the interstate. I saw the lights behind me, pulled me over. I was going about 13 miles an hour over the speed limit. No big deal, really. Minor ticket. Shouldn't be all that worried about it, but I was. And I was worried because I knew what was in the car. And by what was in the car, I did not mean by that debate evidence <laughs> or luggage, at least not clothes, luggage. What I'm talking about is what I knew to be in the briefcase of my debate coach, who was then uh, and probably is historically even the biggest drug dealer in the history of the college and or high school debate circuit at that time. He has since passed, actually, of a drug overdose. No shocker there. But I knew what was in his briefcase at that very moment that I was being pulled over. What was in his briefcase was two and a half ounces of weed, an eight ball of cocaine, six sheets of acid, and 12 hits of ecstasy. For those of you not skilled in the narcotic arts, let me just assure you, that is way more drugs than an individual can do. So if they pop you with that much, they are going to get you for possession with intent to distribute, and you are going to go to prison. So I had every reason to be afraid. When the cop comes to my window, he raps on the glass with his baton. I roll the window down. You see, I do this motion. A lot of times, young people in colleges don't know what this is. But, <laughs> but this is an adult crowd, so most of y'all will know. And if you're too young to know, this is what we used to have to do. I rolled the window down, and he asked me for my license. So as I start to sweat, and I'm getting very nervous, looking around, worried, right, I start to look for my wallet. I couldn't find it. Finally found the wallet, started looking for my license, couldn't find it. I'm looking, I'm looking. It seemed like it took a week. Right? It was only probably like 20 seconds, but I still couldn't find it. And I'm sweating, and I'm nervous, and my voice is cracking as I'm talking to the cop, like I'm going through puberty again. So he can tell I'm nervous. He says, do you want to come back to the cruiser and sit in the front seat? The light is way better there. I did not want to go to his police car. But I didn't really think I had much choice, so I said, sure. I went to his car. I sat down. He was right. The light was far better in there. I started looking for my license. I'm looking. I'm looking. I still can't find it. I flip over one of those little plastic things that has the pictures in it, and there is my fake ID, which is of no use in moments like this. <laughs> And he sees it and he says, isn't that it? I'm like, no, 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 no idea what that is. It's a craft project or something. I don't know what that is, even though it said Maine driver's license right there, like as in the state of Maine, not because I'm from Maine, never even been to Maine at that point in my life. But when we made the fake IDs down in Louisiana, we were like, nobody knows what a Maine license looks like. Let's just go with that. <laughs> so he sees it. And he starts to reach for it. He knows I'm lying to him. Now he starts to reach for it. Just as he grabs the wallet, I flip one more plastic thing and I find the real license. I had flipped that same plastic thing seven or eight times, couldn't find it. Now I did. And I pull it out. I'm like, here it is. He goes, are you sure that's the one you want to go with? I said, yes. He wrote me a ticket for $75. He let me go on my way. Now... I could stop right there and make the point because anybody who believes that that stop would have gone that way if I'd been black or brown in 1988 or next week hasn't been paying attention not to this talk but to this country at any point in your life because if I'm black or brown exhibiting that level of nervousness having in clear vision line of sight of the cop a fake ID which is in of itself a misdemeanor punishable at that time by $5,000 and up to 60 days in jail they're going to toss that car. When they toss that car, they're going to find those drugs. When they find those drugs, we're going to be arrested, and I'm going to go to prison. 
And I'm not going to be here or doing any of the things that I've done for 30 years. That is why the past and the memory of law enforcement inequity is so important, because we're all implicated in it. People of color as the targets of it, white folks as the beneficiaries of it. We're all implicated. It's not about feeling guilty about that. It's about being enraged that we were sold a bill of goods as to the country in which we lived, and we live in a very different one. But if we don't understand that history, we can't understand black and brown anger. If we don't understand the history as regards immigration, we can't understand what's going on at the border right now. See, white folks are all upset about brown people. Because notice, that is what it is. I mean, let's just be clear. We're not worried about this border. We're only worried about this border. Not, not this border. Only that one. We're not worried about crafty Canadians sneaking in to take advantage of our superior health care system. Please note Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky just recently had hernia surgery. Where did he go? He went to Canada, not Lexington. Right? We're only worried about this border because we know that it's those people coming across. And a lot of white Americans have convinced ourselves of a lie. That's why we find it so easy not to see the humanity of those folk and to separate their families and to talk about building walls. Because, see, we, we've created a fiction in this country, white America. We've created a fiction that says that all of our ancestors, when they got here, they were all reading Chaucer and contemplating complex mathematical equations. And we all had clean fingernails and a lot of skills and spoke five languages. But the reality is we were the losers of Europe, and nobody wants to say that. Nobody wants to admit it. We were the losers of, and I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm not saying that to be cruel. I'm saying it because it's incontrovertibly true. And how do I know? Easy, the winners don't get on the boat, y'all. Why would you get on the boat if you were winning? You wouldn't. The winner never gets on the boat. The winner's winning. The winner stays put because it's going pretty good for the winner. Nobody likes to move. If you're doing well in England, you're doing well in Scotland, you're doing well in Ireland, or Germany, why the hell would you tell your family, let's just, I don't know what the hell, let's just risk it, y'all. <laughs> let's just start it all over again. But apparently we think it was the winners. We got this, and we get on ancestry looking for kings and queens and stuff like that. I want to be related to royalty. You know what the odds of that? You know, like people, I want to see if my people came over on the Mayflower. All right, don't do that. Do you have any idea who was on that ship and who was on some of the other early ships? I know who wasn't on there. The king. The king wasn't on there. Nobody the king particularly wanted to keep around was on there. A lot of people he didn't really care about keeping around were on there. Right? They didn't come here looking for freedom. They didn't come here looking for... They created unfreedom in the colonies. And not just for black people and indigenous people, but even for themselves. Right? The thumbnail sketch of the colonial period in America is pretty much looking for witches and punishing those who didn't pray to God in the same way that you did. See, this was a horrible case of unfreedom, but we told this lie that we were the winners, that we were noblemen, and that we came looking for pr these principles like freedom and liberty. And these people, see, they're just coming for stuff. That's the, that's the narrative. They're coming to take advantage. We came for principles. But everybody who immigrates voluntarily comes for the same thing, opportunity. Yeah, it's stuff like the ability to continue living. Right? Right? And the whole notion of legal and illegal, this is a word trick that we use. Legal and illegal is just a function of power. And who has the right to make the law? And I know this from my own family's experience too, because when my great-grandfather, my father's father's father, came to this country, that's the Jewish-Russian side of my family. The rest had been here for a very long time, but that side of the family only came more recently. That great-grandfather of mine sailed into the harbor in New York, coming from Minsk, which was at that time Russia, now part of modern-day Belarus, had the misfortune of coming into the harbor in 1901, about eight or nine days after President McKinley had been shot by an assassin's bullet. Now, if you know your history, you know McKinley lingered for about two weeks before he died. So this was during the period when he had been shot and he was holding on. He hadn't quite died, but there was a hysteria that swept the land for a very brief period of time, and it would resurge again over the ensuing years. But at this particular moment in 1901, because his assassin, Leon Shalgas, had parents who were from Minsk, the same place whence my great-grandfather and his shipmates came, they turned the ship around and sent it back to Russia, made him illegal, you see, for the time being. It took six and a half to seven years for him, and I don't know about his shipmates, whether they ever made it back, but it took my great-grandfather six and a half to seven to save up enough money to come back again. 
The fact that they rendered him illegal in that moment had nothing to do with him, though, did it? See, it didn't speak to his character, his decency, his morality. It had nothing to do with him. It had everything to do with the indecency and the immorality of those who were empowered to decide who was and was not capable of coming here and participating. That's why our historical memory has to be better. Because if we continue in this tradition, we don't understand that they are us and we are them. We cannot see the humanity in the other because we've told ourselves so many lies. Ultimately, if we're going to pull out of this, we have to demand a more honest accounting of where we have been and where we are today, understanding the bright line between the politics of the past and the politics of the present. That begins with commemorations of Dr. King, but it certainly cannot end there. If we are going to move forward, we have to be a people not of the lie, but of truth. Because as James Baldwin, whose face now looks at me as I'm speaking, said in the pages of Ebony Magazine in 1965, speaking of white America, he said, people who imagine that history flatters them, as it does indeed since they wrote it, are impaled on their history are impaled on their history like a butterfly on a pen, and they become incapable of seeing or changing themselves or the world. This is where it appears to be most white Americans find themselves impaled. They are dimly or perhaps vividly aware that the history they have fed themselves is mainly a lie, but they do not know how to be released from it. And they suffer enormously from the resulting personal incoherence. Indeed, thank you all so very much for being here. Let's clap it again for Tim Wise. So we have um, 30 minutes for Q&A from the audience to interact with Tim. But I've just told that uh, City Council President Mildred Crump is here and would like to bring a few words of greetings. to make me sick, right? <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, full disclosure, um, I actually came tonight uh, because I have the privilege of living on a street with a phenomenal couple uh, who are in the business of changing minds, changing thoughts, changing actions, and they put their money where their mouth is. You know I'm talking about Ryan and Charity Hager. They are my neighbors. They are my neighbors, and I am so uh, peacock, peacock proud and happy glad uh, that I am able to be in the space uh, that they occupy. Uh, certainly, uh, to everyone who was here, I need to thank uh, Ingrid and whomever else is responsible uh, for using this beautiful space. Uh, James must be looking down from heaven saying, you all, yeah, take, come on, give it up for James. I'm not talking about, for those of you who don't know, I'm not talking about James Baldwin. I'm talking about James Brown. All right, does that make a difference? So I'm, I'm here uh, to um, uh, pay homage uh, once again. Uh, the, the staff of the library uh, is growing by leaps and, and, and leaps and bounds. I've been talking all day. Uh, leaps and bounds in my estimation. Uh, who would have thought uh, that five years ago um, we would be here uh, Linda, we would be here in this space uh, 
that was created, the, the idea was created by uh, someone like uh, James Brown. And so I salute all of you. Uh, if I start calling names, I don't want to miss anyone. Uh, but I do want to encourage you and let you know that the Newark Municipal Council uh, supports this institution uh, of learning. Um, I am so, I see he's standing there, I mean, that's a sign. I know what that means. Uh, but I'm paying him no attention. You notice I'm not paying him any attention. Because I have to say a word about our speaker. Um, boy, was that a history lesson? That was a history lesson. And those of you who know me are going to understand uh, what I say next. I never knew a white boy who knew as much about black history as our speaker on tonight. Give it up for him. <laughs> really? It's okay. For those of you, I hope you're not offended. It's just a reality. Uh, thank you so much for sending me an invitation. Um, I do, the, the mayor would have been here, but he unfortunately is seriously ill. Uh, he has a dreadful cold, and I had the pleasure, Frederico, telling him, go home, get in the bed. You're no good to us sick. Uh, so thank you so much for giving me the opportunity uh, to say a few words and um, uh, keep up the good work. So, so we'll, we'll do like 20, 25 minutes of questions, I guess? Is that, is that what we're going to do? Okay. You want to do a photo for, oh, yeah, that'd be great. Well, so you, you have questions of the mic right here in the center, and there's a the mic on the outside, and right here, on the three mics. Thank you. You coming? <laughs> <laughs> Obey your health. Yeah, absolutely, all the time. Okay, so we've got a mic here, and there are others on the sides if you're interested in those. We'll start here. Yes. Thank you, Brother Eyes, for uh, coming back to New York. I wonder if you would mind uh, weighing in on presidential politics. Uh, Sister Kamala Harris yesterday uh, gave a uh, incredible presentation both in Oakland and later in Iowa. There were a number of questions regarding the issue of a black woman running for president and is America ready? And conjoined with that question is, should she have a white vice presidential uh, uh, person with her, preferably male? As I know you're not a pollster, but as a white male in America, who's very clear about white, white men, can you weigh in on that? I'd be, I'd be curious as to your opinion about that. Thank so this, this will be the, the functional flip of the old Chappelle skit, I know black people. This will be the I know white people version of that. Um, so let me say this. First, I think the fact that, that she gets that question, Putting aside her as a candidate, the fact that that question is asked of a black woman, A, are we ready? Which implicitly starts with the presumption that we're always ready for another white guy. We're always ready for that. We don't ask, no matter how well or badly they do, by the way. It doesn't matter if they run the economy into the ground. It doesn't matter if they start wars on false pretense doesn't matter if they sit around watching cable news and rage tweeting all day. It doesn't matter. They're always qualified and it's always time. It's always white man time. The second aspect of that question about putting a white man on the ticket, well, if, if we are an emerging multicultural society, as we are, if it is true, and it is, that within 20 years, half the country will be people of color, half will be white, then I suppose I should expect any minute now that the other party will be asked of its candidates, when are they going to put a woman of color on their ticket? 
to capture that emerging vote. And of course, I say that completely tongue in cheek because I know that's not going to happen. Because that other party has gone in as the semi-official white nationalist Afrikaner party. That isn't to say the Democrats don't do their own version of it. It is to say that one is official and the other one just sort of plays white nationalist every now and then. You know, they, 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 they dabble in it and they come back to it. So um, whether or not, now that's a philosophical discussion though about why we ask one and not the other and a moral discussion. Um, practically, I don't know because I learned uh, in 08, if not before that, that I don't know what the hell I'm talking about in terms of who's going to win. Because when Barack Obama won, I didn't think a week later that it had happened. Like, I remember I was like, nah, that just didn't happen. Like, there's just, this just didn't happen. And then when he won re-election, I'm like, there's, I know white people. This just didn't happen. And, and I did actually know white folks because white folks didn't make it happen. Had it been up to white folks, it wouldn't have happened. Luckily, there were enough other folks that made it happen. Just like I knew in 90 and 91 when I was um, in Louisiana and involved in the campaigns against David Duke, that six out of 10 white people gladly voted for him. And they knew he was a Nazi at the time. So I've never, ever underestimated the ability of white folks um, to cleave to white supremacy when the chips are down. So would it be smart politically for her to have a white person on the ticket and preferably a white male? Uh, possibly. But, you know, there was an interesting thing that ta Coates said the other day, and, and I don't remember where I heard him say it. I don't think it was in the conversation with, uh, the, 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 with Ocasio-Cortez, although it might have been. He made a comment, I think it might have even been before that, though. He was talking about presidential politics, and he said um, that one of the things that's troubling about white Democrats is that they have to go out of their way to perform wokeness right, to get black and brown votes. And it's almost embarrassing, right? Like when white folk, you know, whether that's Hillary Clinton trying to talk about, you know, race stuff when she has no history on this at all, that's good, plenty of history on it that was quite bad, very little that was good. Um, or whether it's Bernie Sanders trying to pretend like he's still in Brooklyn as opposed to Vermont and, and that he's actually still like really in tight with, and I'm not trying to, look, I, I like a lot of his politics, I'm just saying like this is not somebody who regularly is embedded in race politic talk or language or conversation or community. Um, and so when white folks go out of their way, the danger, ta Coates made the point was, you remind all those white folks, oh yeah, yeah, it's about race, I forgot the Democrats are the black party or the brown party. The thing about a candidate of color is they don't have to do that, and in fact, they know they can't do that. Like, they can't lead with a race conversation. They can talk about it, but they can't make that. It's just their very presence, and Obama actually proved this. His very presence is what alerted a lot of white folks to the fact that, oh, wow, this is, this is sort of what the party is now, and you're either down with that or you're not down with that. But it actually is harder, I think, for a white Democrat in a moment where everybody knows the base of the voters for the Democratic Party are black and brown, and especially black women, right, the, the fundamental cornerstone of that vote. So, so if you're a white person trying to get that vote, you gotta go out of your way to prove how down you are, and then that just reminds all those white folks that didn't wanna be down, they're like, oh yeah, I forgot. But if it, was, if it was Senator Harris, if it was any person of color, it would almost, in a weird way, fly under the radar and wouldn't be, yeah, her physical presence would be obvious, right, as a person of color, but the fact that she would probably talk about it less because she wouldn't have anything to prove to anybody about being black, right, about being a woman of color. She wouldn't have to prove that. So in a weird way, rhetorically, her campaign would be less race focused. I might wish that it would be more because I think we need to be talking about this stuff front and center, but I just know how it's gonna go. I know how it's gonna go based on what happened with, with Barack Obama. So my guess is in a way, yeah, she might need that for some people, but that might actually hurt her with other people. And I'm not really sure since I'm not a pollster which way to go, but it's certainly an interesting conversation that we're gonna have to have in the next six months to a year. Next question. Yes. Um, thank you for coming tonight. I studied your books in college, and I've been a really big fan for a decade, so I'm really excited. Um, I obviously am white, and therefore <laughs> I, have, I have the very distinct, I guess, uh, you know, I have a lot of white privilege, obviously, but I have the sort of um, responsibility, I would say, as well, to um, dismantle systematic 
anti racism and uh, unpack white privilege. Um, how do you, with our historical uh, short term memory, uh, how, how, how would you suggest talking to white people who have that short term memory or who like literally, like, it's so the fake news, I mean, the things that people say on Facebook when I try to engage, and you know, I've tried, and then I just end up getting angry, and then people say, well, you have to be nicer. But I'm like, I'm angry. People's lives are right. at, at risk here. So how do we get, a, get across that sort of wall? Right. So there are two conversations that we have to have. We have to be able to do them both as well as possible. And I think sometimes we only focus on one or the other. So the one conversation is the one you're asking about, which is the if you will, the conversion story, which is how do we get people who are over there to come over here or at least soften their opposition so that they're not as problematic, right? That's an important conversation. Um, there's also another conversation, and I don't think that they're exclusive. I mean, they can both happen at the same time, really, uh, and in the same person. But let's just be mindful of it. That second conversation is not so much a conversion story as it is a mobilization story. Now here's why I want to say this, because sometimes I think we can spend too much time worrying about saving folk. Not everybody can be saved. Some folks don't want to be saved. Right? And, and, and although I would love dearly to have the movement against white supremacy include the majority of white people, I am no fool. And I am firmly convinced that that won't happen. Just like I don't think most men are ever really going to sign up to fight patriarchy. Well. And I don't really think that most people with money are going to wake up one day and go, you know, the class system is really out of control. <laughs> I just don't think that's going to happen. Um, that doesn't mean some won't, and it doesn't mean that enough might not. I don't know what enough is. I know it's less than 50% plus one, and it's more than what we got now. That much I know. So then the question becomes conversion versus mobilization. Now, there are strategies for each. The reason mobilization is important, keep in mind what Ralph Reed, who was the head of this thing called the Christian Coalition back in the 80s. Pat Robertson set this group up, right-wing Christian evangelicals, white folks overwhelmingly. What did Ralph Reed say in 1988, 89, I think is when he said it. He said, we don't need the majority of Americans to agree with us. All we need is about six to eight, maybe 10% because everybody else will be at home watching Falcon Crest, which is a TV reference I can make in this room, but you can imagine when I make it at colleges, folks are like, yeah, I don't know what the hell Falcon Crest is. So I have to say watching Netflix, or I have to say watching, you know, The Bachelorette or whatever, right? Something that they can get. But that's what he said. In other words, he was saying, most people are sleeping on this. They're not paying attention. They're amusing themselves to death. So as long as we're doing our thing, we win. And he hasn't been far from right, has he? So in a sense, even though I'd love to have the majority, because that would be a more democratic, small d, democratic movement, um, that's not how history's made. So in part, let's remember, we gotta be mobilizing our people. That's a very different conversation. It's not the conversion, that, that's, the, that's the mobilization, that's the inspiration, that's the get out of bed and do it again conversation, in spite of everything that we know will be thrown at all of us who take up these issues, and as people of color know, on pain of death all of their lives. So there's that. If we're going to do the, the, the conversion narrative, though, let's, let's keep in mind um, a couple of ways of doing it. So back in November of last year, I was at a college in Colorado, and there were some white students who wanted to know this very same thing about particularly how they were going to go about this at Thanksgiving. Right? They were going to go home to their families, and they were going to be at the Thanksgiving table, and things were going to go haywire, right? because their racist uncle was coming. Note, it is always a racist uncle. It is apparently never anyone's father. It is apparently just someone's childless father's brother is who it is. It's never the father. It's always uncle. The uncle's coming. The uncle's going to say some crazy stuff he heard on Fox or Breitbart or got a Facebook message about from some Russian bot, you know. So what do we say? And I said, well, sometimes it's good to start with what you don't do. So here's what you don't do with your uncle at the Thanksgiving table or anyone like him in a similar setting. Do not start by busting out your intersectional feminist theory 101 textbook that you got at the college. Because even though that stuff is true and really important 
and critical for your uncle to eventually internalize. He ain't ready. Uncle Bill, or whatever his name is, is not ready for Kim Crenshaw. I wish that he was. I really do wish that he was, but he's not. And so if you're 19 years old and you talk to your 57-year-old uncle at the, at the Thanksgiving table and you're like, look what I know, no 57-year-old wants to be told anything by a 19-year-old, anything at all. I got a 17 and a 15-year-old, love them dearly. Don't need to hear from them on lots of stuff, right? So I don't want to, because really what that 19-year-old college student just said to the uncle is, look how much more I know than you, you stupid old man that didn't go to college. Nobody responds well to that. So I said, instead, what I would do is I would start off by asking your uncle, how does he know what he knows? I don't want to know what you know, Uncle Bill. I already know that. I want to know why you think it, why you believe it, why you know it to be true. Because what I have found in my experience is two things. Number one, when you do that, and that person has to actually think through the process. And if they say things like, well, I've seen this evidence. Okay, but tell me why you find that evidence persuasive, right? Because the evidence itself, we all got evidence for everything we believe. And the research, uh, neuroscience research says, every one of us looks at evidence in a biased way. None of us are objective. None of us just, you know, let's be honest, no matter what you think about the subjects, like the ones I talked about, none of us have sat down and actually read everything there is to read, every study, every statistic, every book. So we're picking and choosing. All of us are cherry picking data. And it doesn't mean some of us aren't right. I mean, I'm right about stuff. But, but, but I could be wrong. Not, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. And Uncle Bill could be right and he could be wrong. So if I'm sitting there talking to him, I want to know why he finds certain things persuasive. And then I can explain to him why I find other things persuasive. Now what we're having is a conversation about our process. Not a conversation about the ideas, which is where we are banging heads. It's about, no, you tell me why. Like if I want to talk to my uncle, if I was, had a racist uncle, say, I just don't, first of all, I don't know where the people get these racist relatives. Like they just don't come to my Thanksgiving. I just don't invite them. Like it's real easy. But, but if I had one and I had to talk to him, if I'm going to try to prove to him that the war on drugs is racist, I can do two things. I can hit him over the head with a lot of data because I know all this stuff in my head, or I can tell him that story about the car that I just told y'all. That's how I know what the war on drugs is really about. That's how I understand white privilege, not because of some theory that I read, because I've lived it. So if I say to him, you tell me why, number one, he's got to think it through. And I have found in my experience when they're trying to think it through, you can see in the back of their head, they're like, yeah, this is bullshit. Like, this is, I got nothing. Like, I'm just making this up. Like, this is really not a good argument. But they're not going to admit that, but they know it. Like, you can see it. You can just see in their eyes, like, oh, boy, I didn't expect to be asked that, you know. The second thing that you've done when you ask that question is you've almost by definition that that person, that hard person you're dealing with, whether it's the uncle at Thanksgiving or just someone on Facebook or anyone else, um, almost by definition, they have to reciprocate. And when they reciprocate, because if you've actually shown interest in why they think stuff, they'd be a real jerk to not ask you why you think stuff. Right. So then now we're having a conversation and we probably won't resolve it. We probably won't get to the point where the uncle's like, oh my God, I've been wrong about everything my entire adult life. Like that just doesn't happen, right? Very rarely does that happen. But what we've done is we've reduced the toxicity in the room, which I guarantee will make you feel better. And that will make you a better advocate. Because if you think that every time you gotta go out there and do battle, it's gonna be this toxic, painful, gut-wrenching, oh my God, here it goes again. This is like beating my head against the wall. If that's what you think it's gonna be, eventually you'll stop doing it. Because it's just, too, it's just too exhausting. But if you know there's a process that you can use that may not work for the purpose you thought you needed, which was conversion, but it might work to keep you in the game and to keep you strong at the motivation and the mobilization piece, then you'll be good and then we'll be good. So I think we need to think of it like that. Yes. here on a rainy night <laughs> to come celebrate the legacy of uh, Martin Luther King. As you were speaking, I, I thought a lot about my own college experience. Born and raised, I was born and raised here in North, educated here in the city, founded an organization in called She Wins Inc. When I went to college in, you know, Western, well, I went to high school, but I went to uh, college in the small town of Spartan, Pennsylvania, surprisingly, that's what I'm wearing today. 
Um, and it was interesting because our campus is predominantly very liberal. I mean, the college itself was founded by Quakers and you know, abolitionists. Um, but you know, one of the things that we found as when I was an organizer on the campus was that when we would have speakers like you come, right? When we would have uh, events like this, the only folks who were in the room were people who already were uh, empathetic towards an understanding of, of this, of this messaging, and of this just honestly these values. And so. Uh, my question to you is, one, what have you, as an organizer, as an activist, what have you actively done to make sure that the right people are in the rooms? Because you know, I can speak a lot to the, the pressure of uh, organizers like ourselves on college campuses who are black and who are brown, um, and even just beyond college campuses alone who are doing this work, and they, there aren't enough of you, right? And then when you guys, and by you I mean like white allies and folks who are this message, and then when you know, you're in these spaces that there isn't often enough folks who, um, who are already sort of against the message in the room. So just, just talk about some of the things you've done. Well, what I've learned over the years is that um, obviously I can't make anyone listen, and I can't make people come to events. Now, the good news is that increasingly I am able to gently persuade or maybe not so gently persuade those schools that bring me, those colleges and high schools and even middle schools and occasionally um, certainly a handful of businesses, there are not a lot of businesses that want to bring me in, but occasionally, um, to either require attendance either you know, as sort of a condition of, of uh, their enrollment at that school, it might be an orientation program or if, obviously if it's a high school they're supposed to come. Although some people have skipped interestingly and being white they didn't get punished for it, but that's a different story. Um, but. Uh, I am able to at least put some pressure on that uh, to ensure that there will be people in the room who need to hear it and maybe aren't already down for what it is that I have to say. Having said all that, and the same thing with my writing, I, uh, my writing is taught in places where people just have to read it because it's in a class and they're being exposed to it, which obviously is not always going to be the choir. Um, as a community organizer, when I, when I did that work actively in the community in New Orleans, of course the, the, the understanding for those of us who do organizing typically particularly if we're organizing in marginalized spaces, you go where you're asked to go. You don't necessarily push yourself into a space. Being white, of course, I have to push myself into certain white spaces, and I do that sort of as a matter of course over the 25 years or so that I've been on the road. Um, but I can't force people to come. I do think that increasingly, most rooms to which I speak um, are not like this one in terms of the makeup of ideological makeup, or, or racial makeup for that matter. They're mostly white spaces. I'm mostly brought, obviously, to white colleges and, and universities, which we, of course, don't call that for reasons that are obvious, because you don't have to specify that, which is taken for granted, like I said before. Um, and in those spaces, the purpose and the function, obviously, of the presentation is to reach those non-choir members. And sometimes that's who shows up. Sometimes it's a mix. Sometimes it is a choir. But there is one thing I would say about that. It sort of goes back to the last question, too. Um, I think we should not underestimate the value of choir practice, right? Sometimes we do get caught up in how do we get those other people in the room, and, and although I want them in the room, and, I've, and that's who I speak to a lot of the time, I also know that I'm from the South, been around a lot of choirs, and if choirs don't practice, I've heard what they sound like. Like they, you know, they all sort of think they're singing the same song. They're on totally different pages of the hymnal. They, they think it sounds great, and they're half of them are tone deaf, and it's just a mess. So, so we, have to, we have to always hear from each other. It's one of the reasons that I'm constantly reading people's work, you know, even if it's stuff that I know a lot about. You know, I'm going to read those books. I'm going to read Carol Anderson. I'm going to read ta Coates. I'm going to read Baldwin. I'm going to read Bell Hooks. I'm going to read all of these folks. Even if I've read their stuff before, I'm going to go back and read it again because you'll see things that you didn't see before. And that's me, and I am the choir, and yet I'm constantly having to re-up my own understanding and then integrate various things into my work and figure out how to, you know, point to those people as sources of wisdom for other people to check out and things of that nature. So, um... I guess the, the answer to the question is there's no way I can guarantee it. What I do is attempt, obviously, by virtue of the places that I'm being asked to come, to, to leave as few options as possible for people to opt out. And we do that by um, trying to, uh, whether that's a little bit of bribery, a little bit of extra credit, whatever. You've got to get extra credit. Just We'll give you that extra credit. You've got to sit through the whole thing, though. 
You can't just come sign the piece of paper at the beginning and walk out the door. You've got to stay. We're going we're gonna to wand you in on a band, make sure you stayed the whole speech. And then that way, you know, if you didn't like what you heard, at least you heard it, you know. We'll do that. Um, and, and there are different ways to try to cajole people. Bring food. You put food out, college students will come, you know. And, and, and I mean, you know, lots of people will. You put food out, they'll come, even if they don't want to hear what you have to say. So we'll do, I'm, not, I'm not above bribery. I'm not beyond bribery. I'm, not a, I'm, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get people in the room, but I do know from my experience that um, sometimes the choir is who comes first and most, and if that's what's happening, that's not necessarily bad. Um, it's just one piece of the work, and, and the other piece is one that we're going to have to figure out, obviously, you know, together. Yeah. Go ahead. Sure. I'm mad that most people here in the city are, are workers, or if you're not workers yourself, you're really in some way. Um, and I think North has been, when I said that North is suffering right now, I'm not saying that we haven't suffered before, but in this particular moment, we're going through a lot. Um, we just lost a lot of children, um, and some of them are still fighting for their lives. Um, and what I think, for me, as an educator, and as someone who works with young people, I'm always trying to think about how I can be more creative about helping young people see that the issues that exist yeah. in the community while individual decision making and volition are a factor, right? There are also these other systematic structures in place that have created the conditions that exist that people yes. make the decisions they make. Um, and so my, my question, and I don't know if it's more of a, we just like kind of have a cathartic moment here or if it's like actually a question, but is what strategies have you seen work in terms of working with young people and helping them understand the greater system of oppression, of poverty, That's education, of unemployment, that impact the decisions that people within those contexts make, right? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, no, I'd love, I, I'd love to talk about that because um, that's a really critical piece of the work I do with high school students and with middle school students when I'm asked to do that, um, which is fairly often now, and, and especially in spaces that are not mostly white and certainly not exclusively white, marginalized spaces both economically, racially, under white supremacy and capitalism. And one of the things that I do when I talk to, I do this when I talk to teachers of children in those communities, but also when I talk to the young people themselves. And there are a lot of people who don't like that I do it, but I think it's the only honest approach, and it's the approach that I've seen work and actually get young people enthusiastic about moving forward in a movement way, both with their education and with their lives. So, so I'll give you an example of something that I did. It's something I do often when I'm speaking in such spaces and to such young people. I went to a conference a couple years ago in, in the Twin Cities, and it was a conference put together by some organizers of some charter schools. And I'm very cynical about charters because I know their origins, but these were folks who seemed about something, and if they were going to bring me in, I'm like, hey, if you're asking me to come, I'm going to go do what I do. So these charters in, the, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, about 80% of the kids are poor, they're overwhelmingly black and brown, and 30% of them are unhoused, living in cars, living on the street, living in people's friend, friends' houses. Um, and so I knew this was a real challenge. And I sat there and I watched the whole day. I was the last speaker. And I watched the other speakers. And what the other speakers did, and this wasn't just white speakers. These were speakers of color, too, who were basically spending their time yelling at these kids, lecturing these kids, telling them to pull up their pants, take their headphones out of their ears, sit up straight, stop slouching, take notes, pay attention, all the stuff teachers tell them every day in school. And the more that they said, take the earphones out of your ears, the louder they turned the volume up in their headphones. The more they said, pull your pants up, they would sag. The more they said, sit up straight, they slouched even more because they were being disrespected. And that was an act of resistance. It wasn't disrespect, it was resistance. So now I'm getting ready to go. And I'm like the last speaker. And I'm like, at the time, I was a 43-year-old white man from Nashville. What in the hell do I have to say to this group of young people? So I got up and what I did and I've done it every time I've been with such young people since, is I stood up and first I started off by apologizing on behalf of the country, which I made clear had not authorized me or deputized me to apologize for it, but I was going to do it anyway. And I said, I want to apologize for lying to y'all. Because this country lied to you. When we said you could be anything you want to be if you just work hard for it, that was a lie. And I suspect you know it was a lie. We didn't mean it. And I gave them a little bit of data to show that it, that, that it wasn't true. What I noticed was a couple things. Number one, the adults were getting very nervous. Very nervous. They're like, holy hell, where is this going? The young people, however, who had been checked out for hours, sat up straight. One young man looked at his buddy next to him, and he's like, 
confused look on his face, and he mouthed the words. He didn't say it out loud because he didn't want to be rude, but he mouthed the words. I'll just quote him directly. What is this shit? And his buddy was like, I don't know, but I like it. They start taking notes. Everybody's paying attention. Now, this is not me bragging on me and my oratorical skills. It had nothing to do with me. All I did in that moment was ratify their truth. That's all I did. I didn't tell them anything they did not know. What I did, however, was tell them something was true that no authority figure, let alone a white man, had ever told them was true. And when black and brown truth is ratified by that authority figure, even though it shouldn't take that, it's criminal that it takes that in their mind. But all of a sudden, they were like, oh, so we're not hallucinating. Oh, so this is really happening. And what I have found is that when I tell young people, that when I, you know, when I say this is the deal, y'all know this is the deal. And I'm just here to tell you because, I mean, I know the secret handshake, y'all. I'm telling you, this is the deal. This is actually what is happening here. Then all of a sudden, these young folks were like, we got to get on this. And, and their whole attitude about education changed. There was a story out of Colorado. Cherry Creek, suburb of Denver, relatively affluent, but still economically mixed in various parts. Cherry Creek, one of the high schools there, math teacher, white guy, gets up teaching like ninth grade, basic level math. The black men in the class were all failing or getting Ds. They weren't paying attention. They were checked out, didn't do their homework, failed the test, but he knew they were smart. So one day he goes in, he starts putting up stuff on the board, all these numbers, charts, graphs, statistics, didn't tell him what it was. 15 minutes later, he finishes filling up the board. They're like, what is that? Is that going to be on the test? Like, what is that? You know, and he's like, no, that's evidence that somebody's trying to kill you. And they were like, wait, what? And he goes and he says, this is the incarceration data in the greater Denver area. This is the wealth disparity between white, black, and brown. This is the racial profiling data, the poverty data, the infant mortality data. Now, do you want to become one of these numbers or you want to blow these numbers up? Because I can do it either way. And now these young people, again, this white man was not telling them things they didn't know. He was just giving them the numbers, the math that demonstrated it so that they would understand math is not just something we have you go do so that you can pass a state exam. Math is something you need to understand because there are folks prepared to make you a number, put a number on you on a, on a, on a prison uniform and lock you away and make you a number forever. So you need to understand math because it actually relates to your life. And now these young black men decided they needed to create a mentoring group for eighth grade black kids. They called it the Brotherhood, scared the hell out of the school board. They were like, what is that? Is that a math gang? What is that? Right? And these young people were like, and they started getting A's and B's. They went from D's and F's to A's and B's. So, I, so to me, the answer to the question is, we, if we tell young people the truth, and, and, and not our truth, their truth, they already see the truth. All we need to do is cosign on the dotted line what they already know to be true, and it opens up a whole world of possibilities, and then they have some of the answers. We need to be listening to them. But the only way we'll ever be able to hear them is if we get on the same page and we demonstrate that we see what they see. That's the only strategy I know that works, and it's the one that I try to use whenever I'm with folks. Yeah. Two kids died in a car crash, and another girl was shot in the head. She was killed while they were at the um, the candle lighting for the two kids who passed away in the car crash. And um, a lot of kids of color are often exposed to trauma at a young age. So my question for you is, how do you break the cycle of trauma that affects young kids of color? It's a great question. I think we have to have educators. They're going to teach in schools with traumatized peoples and traumatized families, not just children, but traumatized families who have inherited a legacy of trauma that didn't just start last week or last month or last year, but is intergenerational in nature, that those teachers have to demonstrate before they can become educators. Those nurses and doctors, before they can provide care in those communities, need to demonstrate some level of competence when it comes to that specific issue. Like right now, I can become a doctor or a nurse in a traumatized, low-income community of color without knowing anything about the people in that community. In fact, folks will pay me a bonus to go work with them. Folks will, folks will be like, oh my gosh, isn't that, isn't that noble of you to go work with those people? But you don't know anything about them. Or you can go get five weeks of training with Teach for America. And then they can dump you in a community you know nothing about, teaching people you know nothing about, right? And, and, and all you've got content knowledge, so if you're teaching math, you know math. You're teaching science, you know science, but you don't know the people. So at some point, we have, to, we have to invest the community with the power to decide 
A, who's going to teach in our schools. They got to pass our test, not just a state test, not just the exam that got them a certification. They have to pass our test to become teachers in this space. Maybe that means they do a probationary period, 120 days, 180 days, where the community gets to meet them, they get to learn about intergenerational trauma, and they have to demonstrate a, a commitment to helping undo it as a condition of their employment. And if they don't do that, they don't get the job. <laughs> Second thing, if you want to be a cop in the community that's marginalized and traumatized, and historically marginalized and traumatized by cops, you got to do the same thing, 180 days. You're not, you don't have a gun, you don't have a badge, you're on probation. You're walking around the streets, you're going to the barber shop, the coffee shop, the church, the mosque. You're meeting people knocking on their doors. You are basically a community organizer for six months. And for that six months, you get to meet people and sit down with them and talk to them. What do you need from us? What do you not need from us? What works for you? What doesn't work for you? The reason that's important is at the end of the six months, the community gets to vote on whether or not you get the gun and the badge and you get to be a cop. And at the end of that six months, think about, think about that. That's not, only, that's not only good for the community, that's good for the cop too. Because if I wanted to be a cop in that community, and I, and I got to know y'all because I've been in the community for six months, so now I know people, right? So now when I see you, I'm not afraid of you. When you see me, you're not afraid of me because we've talked about our kids. We've talked about our dreams and our aspirations. So when you see me, I'm not an occupier. When I see you, you're not a, you're not a gangbanger. You're not somebody I'm worried about. So then... Now, I'm safer. If I'm safer, the community's safer. If the community's safer, I'm safe. We're all safer. So we need to actually start saying, this is really about self-determination. Traumatized people need self-determination. What does that look like? It looks like choosing your teachers, choosing your law enforcement officials, and choosing the people who dispense care to you every day and who are there to help, which means all the social service agencies. And all the service providers need to also be trained consistently and every single year on trauma-informed care, on, on, on what Joy DeGruy calls post-traumatic slave syndrome, on, on what people understand as the epigenetic inheritance of trauma and the way that this stuff is passed down in the genes. Like, if you don't know that stuff, how are you going to provide care to people? And I'll just close it with this because I know that we're running out of time. But I don't know if you all know about the epigenetic research on this. This, this epigenetics, right, is this thing that... I mean, I'm not a scientist, so I had to look it up. But I mean, basically, it explains right the, the way that certain genetic things get turned on or off like a light switch, right? So we all have genetic predispositions to certain things, but sometimes those genes don't express or don't get turned on. But under certain circumstances, that gene can be flipped like a switch, and it now is activated, and it does either damage or it can do good stuff too. And the problem is what the researchers found, they started looking at mice, right? And they would take these mice, and they would put them in, in cages, and they would um, subject them to a shock, uh, just a, a little shock that you know, wouldn't hurt them, but would, well, it probably did hurt, but I mean, it, you know, it wasn't gonna kill them, it just let them know that the shock happened. And what they would do is they would administer the shock after pumping in a smell into the cage, like lavender or something, right? And so after a while, you can imagine, when they've done this enough, the, mount, the, the mice will respond when they smell the lavender, even before the shock, because they know it's coming, so they'll start jumping, right? That's not surprising. But what happened is the researchers then had the mice breed, and then had the mice that were bred breed again. So we got two generations out now, the grand mice, if you will, of the original mice. And they had never been shocked. They'd never been subjected to a shock, but you put them in a cage, you pump in the smell of lavender, and they would jump. And they'd never even felt the shock after the lavender. How did they know that? That was literally passed down at the level of cell memory. And now they've done similar research with uh, folks who were survivors of the European Holocaust and found similar symptoms in two, three generations out among European descended Jews. Now, if that can happen to European Jews in two, three generations, you telling me that doesn't happen to black folks over hundreds and hundreds of years? Of course it does. Indigenous people, ironically, always knew this. Right? Indigenous people always knew this. They talked about the soul wound of colonialism. They talked about uh, dreams of colonial, you know, colonialism and conquest that they had not personally experienced, but that they knew their ancestors had. And, they, and people with Western science said, oh, this is nonsense. And now Western science is learning that that's actually accurate. So if I'm going to teach traumatized people and I don't know anything about that, I'm not qualified. If I'm going to be a doctor and I don't know anything about that, I'm not qualified. So med schools need to be teaching that. Teacher training schools need to be teaching that, right? Law enforcement uh, academies, police academies need to be teaching aspiring officers about that because that's how people are going to respond to you on the street. They're responding to you this, based on 
decades and generations of bad experiences. It's not just about you, Mr. Officer. It's about folks that look just like you who knocked down my grandmother's door looking for somebody that hadn't even done anything. I mean, it, you know, it, so, so I think having, if you can deal with trauma, you have to guarantee that the care providers, the people whose job it is to quote unquote help, actually understand what it is they need to be helping with. And a lot of times they don't because they act as if the behaviors of marginalized people emerge organically from the marginalized as opposed to the systems within which marginalized people find themselves. Thank you. Take one more real quick, because there's uh, standing over there. Yeah, go ahead. Um, readings from PSAC New York. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of the questions um, tonight sort of rest within the idea of white neoliberal ideology as a manifestation of white supremacy. And when we talk about, um, whether we talk about pedagogy, or we talk about whether or not Kamala Harris should have a white man run, or whether or not you know, uh, Barack Obama uh, really address issues of race. All of these things rest within the construct of white neoliberal ideology. And I want to pick up on something that you and Ryan talked about, which was allies. And often when we talk about allies in this movement, we're talking about white neoliberals. And white neoliberals who are manifestations of white supremacy. So how do we begin to unpack this ally um, uh, ideology? This illusion. How do we begin to unpack it? You know, I did. I did a, a talk on uh, race, power, justice, and uh, at the end of it, um, uh, and there are not enough white people in this room to actually have this kind of conversation, and we should have far more white people in this room to talk about allies, because white neoliberals like to talk about allies. Right. Uh, these, um, these two white women said, so what should we do? And I said, you know, I don't do action plans to address white supremacy. That's, you have to figure that out. I said, yeah. but one of the things you can do, which goes back to the young sister who just spoke, one of the things I said you can do is the next time a mother is sitting in the street holding her dead son who's bleeding because there's been police violence in her neighborhood, Tell that black mother to go home and bury her child and not to wage her mourning at a public forum mm -hmm. demanding justice with no peace. Mm -hmm. Then call every other white person you know and go to the police station three deep and demand justice without peace. Mm -hmm. Let's begin to unpack what ally needs and you know, in a peace out movement, I struggle with this. We struggle with this on what ally means, where the power rests in that alliance, uh, and how does that relationship work? Right. I think that that's exactly right. And I've, on many occasions, uh, in the wake of police violence, have made similar um, recommendations to white folks trying to figure out what it is that we need to do. Um, we need to be going to those police stations exactly like you said. We also need to be showing up at those schools that so often function like prisons, demanding the same thing. Um, and I think, uh, uh, and we need to be showing up on election day, not just to vote, see, but to demand that in the process of doing this very neoliberal bourgeois thing, which is valid and it has validity, I'm not trying to say it's not valid, um, but we also need to be raising these deeper issues about what voting is, what voting is not, demonstrating to the extent we can legally in those places and in those areas to, to raise those issues. Um, and so I think, I think it is absolutely the case that when we do our demonstrations, when we do our marches, we have to put ourselves in the front lines of, of the possible attack from law enforcement. And there have been some good examples of this happening, not nearly enough of them, but a few that where this has happened. Of course, even then, what has happened has actually demonstrated the truth of what they were trying to demonstrate, which is they won't brutalize us the same way. They really won't. In fact, they'll move around the white folks to find some black and brown folks to brutalize. But the point is still made, and there's still value in the effort of, of trying to do that, though I think the deeper, the deeper the line, the better, obviously. But I also think part of unpacking the ally piece is remembering a couple things. Um, and that is that solidarity is going to look different for different white people. It's going to look different based on where your inflection points happen to be, right? The job that you have, 
the community where you live, the various organizations to which you belong. And so, for example, within the People's Institute and, and this long history of, of the People's Institute and European descent being the sort of solidarity and ally faction within that historically, there's always been this discussion about accountability, for instance, and what does that look like? And all of us who've been part of it and who've been trained by the People's Institute have, have never come up with a final answer on that. I mean, in fact, it's gotten to the point, right, where it became a bit of a joke within the movement and within the organization where finally the white folks kept saying, how do we be accountable, how do we be accountable? And Ron Chisholm, who was co-founder of the Institute, basically said, why don't y'all just go do something and we'll let you know if you screwed it up, right? Like, like stop asking for permission to act because that's what we do. It's like we come to people of color and we say, what do we do? And, and Ron was just like, just, just go and do. And if you, if you make a mistake, we will let you know. And then your job, being accountable, is to not do it again. Like, do something different. And, and that's what solidarity looks like. But I think we're so desirous of getting it right. See, the problem with allyship, in my estimation, and this is something I've seen in myself and I've seen it in others, is we're so wanting to not screw up and not make mistakes that we forget that there's almost no way not to screw up and almost no way not to make a mistake in a system that literally subsidizes our mistakes. Subs and they're not even mistakes in the system. They're, they're functional in the system. Um, so we're going to make those errors and we're going to say the wrong thing and do the wrong thing and then we have to get up like adults and try again listening to the people of color who were saying to us do this or try this or do this differently. So part of unpacking it is remembering that allyship and solidarity is not about per, uh, perfected wokeness. It's not about performative wokeness. It's not about demonstrating one's ideological commitment. It's about figuring out ways to put yourself on the line. And it's not always easy to do. And some people in certain jobs are going to do it differently than others. So if I'm a physician, it's going to look differently than if I'm a kindergarten teacher. If I'm a kindergarten teacher, it's going to look differently than if I'm an entrepreneur who's starting a business. If, if I'm an entrepreneur, it's going to look different than if I'm an elected official or if I'm a poet or a writer or an actor or whatever the things people do. But all of it should be guided by a recognition that allyship requires first and foremost followership. It requires first and foremost listening to the leadership of people of color, but being willing to act Right? And then, and even when you don't know the right way to go, even when you don't know the proper direction, knowing that you could make a mistake and then that you can learn from those mistakes. And I think that too often times we don't do that. We, we wait until the perfect moment to do something and there's never such a moment, right? You want to follow up? Yeah. So I, I think the most important thing is that um, white neoliberals are not owning that, right. that, that, that particular, that ideology is a manifestation of white supremacy. Yeah. Yeah. And we're not exposing white neoliberalism it's informing pedagogy, it's informing curriculum, it's informing public policy, it's informing police strategies, it's also informing the black governments that we're putting into place nationally and locally. That's white neoliberal philosophy expressing yes. itself and I think we have to expose that if we're going to engage in social transformation right. and build once after that, then right. build out. Right. Well, no, I think that's, a, that's a very important point, and I think that part of what activists who are trying to speak in intersectional ways are trying to raise are these issues of neoliberalism as they relate to class and the intersection between class and race and the way in which most of the pedagogical approaches and activist approaches are not revolutionary or transformative. It's not to say that there is not value in reformism. It's a question of whether or not reform is going to serve as anesthesia or adrenaline, and that is up to our analysis, number one, and then um, what we make of the decisions that we, that we uh, take. I mean, you know, reform can be adrenaline, but it can also anesthetize. And so that's what we have to be talking about ideologically, philosophically. And we need to be doing that in our activist spaces. You know, there was a period of time in the 60s and early 70s when that sort of popular education, right, was seen as a central part of activism. That it wasn't just you go out and you act. You also, there was a very critical, deep, whether it was within the Panthers, whether, whatever it was, where there was a conversation about these, these issues of capitalism, of patriarchy, of, of white supremacy, and the way that they intersect, and the way that they limit and narrow our choices that we're even allowed to think about. And I think that's something that we have lost. And we've lost that uh, in part, in part because we got all these symbolically valuable manifestations of progress. Whether that was, you know, Mississippi, for example, will be proud to tell you, they have the most black elected officials of any state in America. Okay. And? Like, does it, I mean, does that make Mississippi like heaven on earth for black people? I mean, it, really? No? I mean, you got a lot of elected officials. We have had a black president. 
might have another one, you know, like, it, okay, and? Like, what does that really mean? And, and that's the question that we ought to be asking. So I think, I think this means we're, we're done, I guess. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it. I'd like to acknowledge one of our board members. He was here somewhere, Jeremy Johnson. And on behalf of Jeremy Johnson, North Arts Council, Jeffrey Trezak, and the rest of the board, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Mr. Tim Wise. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank Brian Haygood, New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. Please consider becoming a friend of the James Brown African American Room. And come back for our Black History Celebration. Thank you. Thank you all. Drive safely. Thank you.